Hi everyone, welcome to UTA Planetarium's another live star stream. My name is Levant Gurdemir, Planetarium Director at UTA, and here in the office, Jim Bader, Program Coordinator, is with me. And today is July 14, 2021, and it almost feels like 2021 is going away. Uh, it's more than half it's gone. So quick. It, it happened, it came and went so fast. I blame. I definitely blame coronavirus for that. The whole year felt like a blur because we also lost like 2020 also. And it is now the time is going at the, the speed of light. And here in the chat, uh, Brexton, uh, Richard, Lamia is with us. Great. Everybody's uh, if you here. have any questions during the stream, uh, please put your um, comments or uh, questions or anything you might uh, like to say in the chat. And I think uh, Jim has good uh, set of news lined up for us. I, I do, I do. I want to uh, jump real quick to um, everybody's comments, though. Richard said, plane flight into space. That is first on the docket for, for the show today. Um, and Brexton, uh, ready for your spacewalk. You got $28 million. That's how much it was, right, Levin? Uh, that's what I heard. Uh, the whole world is talking about how much money it takes. Well, uh, I mean, space tourism has been thought for, uh, I think, over a decade. Uh, and uh, always the price tag was known to be very high. Uh, at least they were expecting a few million dollars back then. Uh, 28 but million. I would blame the increased gas prices, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's all OPEC's fault. That's right. <laughs> anyway, hi, Brexton, Richard. Uh, so glad to see you back. You've been gone. We've missed you and your presence in the chat. And Lamia back. Thank you guys so much. for. Anyway, yeah, Levin, we have we have some news we got to get to um, that I think is important. So, All right, let's look at the news. News number one. Uh, we have uh, Richard's uh, reply to Richard. Um, it went to space to Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic um, successfully sent their stuff to space. I think this is fantastic. Here's a shot of the whole ship kind of put together. You got the mothership there with the two outsides. This is a crazy concept to get to space, right? Um, and then holding a VSS Unity or Virgin Spaceship Unity in the center. Um, and they just flew this plane to like 48,000 feet, dropped off the bottom half. Um, you can see uh, this, this plane actually this image back over here. Yeah, took them straight to space. Uh, this is, I think, I don't know, this is wild. A uh, bunch of space tourists, very little science as far as I'm aware. I think there was a, a comment about one of the mission specialists. Can't see her. She's, I think she's directly behind Richard here. Um, did take a small experiment. Uh, with her, but it's a new era, right, Levant? This is wild, um, totally wild. Anyway, they went pretty high. I think they they went in total like fifty eight miles. Okay, so uh, that's a hit a total of three Gs on the way up and on the way back down. The whole concept behind the Virgin Galactic spaceship thing is actually crazy, really, really cool. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, they didn't quite go to space according to the international guidelines, but they went to space where NASA and um, I guess our military claim. So 50 miles up is where NASA claims, and guys, I guess they brushed it. Well, if you actually look from a uh, classroom uh, globe perspective, 50, mi 50 miles is not even noticeable height. Uh, from the surface it's of not, Earth. Not even the resin from the outside. Uh, I mean, if uh, from somebody watching from outside, uh, there's a planet Earth, they are, let's say, looking through a telescope, and uh, it's just a spaceship or the airplane uh, just going slightly above and coming back, and uh, it costs a lot of money, and the whole world is uh, celebrating this. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, 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 in my opinion, the, the space travels, going to space is uh, maybe uh, visiting a few other stars or uh, even a black hole. Hopefully one day yeah. I would set the goal for further visiting uh, nearby stars. <laughs> 
maybe the center of galaxy. Yeah, I mean, you I, know, I just we talked about the possibility with uh, Dr. Ben Jones a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, and uh, if we can just figure out the Einstein's uh, special relativity and the general relativity uh, physics, then uh, the, those things are possible. Uh, I, I don't know, but the whole concept, and it's mentioned in the in the the chat here. Uh, Richard's uh, high altitude flight didn't really count as space, though. That's true, definitely. Kurt um, didn't count as space internationally. Let's say they had a very very high altitude flight. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, very high altitude. Um, did he make it high enough to qualify as space? Yeah, technically to some standards, but. Like you know, Levent, I mean, it's kind of arbitrary where the line is. We, I we mean, draw a line. There is no line. Just uh, the yeah. atmosphere gets uh, just uh, less dense uh, as you go up. And at one point, the, uh, the, the molecules, and uh, they are not uh, dense enough that we cannot just breathe or um, uh, there, there is no useful air. Uh, you cannot just push mm -hmm. the air by a jet engine. Um, yeah. Uh, they, they, I mean, they draw a line uh, in different resources, uh, site different uh, kilometers or miles from the, the, the space. But certainly, I mean, at, after some point, you're in space. Yeah. There yeah. is no useful atmosphere available anymore. Um, and then uh, we have just a billionaire out for a joyride from Kirsch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not wrong there. <laughs> uh, wait, is he a billionaire? I don't think Richard Brain. He might be. I don't know. Also, do we have to call him sir? We're Americans. Is that a thing we have? Disrespectful. Sir Richard Brand. Um, anyway, uh, Kenneth says, can we... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, we got a couple going into space, that's for sure. Uh, Richard said, uh, boy and Apollo trips? Now private citizens? Right, Levin? It's cool. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm slowly imagining this uh, great uh, space elevator that they, they were imagined a <laughs> uh, long time ago. But uh, that didn't happen because uh, there is some problems with the, the physics again. Physics is always <laughs> the problem uh, <laughs> or challenge with those things. Um, yeah, uh, Mia says, an important point I like or, or I yeah. think is the possibility to land on Earth. Mm -hmm. Once it's settled, I think there may be a better chance for space flight. I yes. do think that's important. They, they landed like a plane. Well, when when they first, uh, you know, uh, the launch to the space race between uh, United States and Russians, uh, you know, the, the Russians went to space first. Uh, and uh, the the way they returned uh, was actually uh, kept as a secret, but there was some like a parachute involved. We know, uh, and Yuri Gagarin uh, was not super successful. Like, you know, entered into the the airspace and uh, landed in a parachute, and the, the rest of the uh, the story with the mission. I thought kept he got secret. stuck in a tree. I don't know why. I thought I remember something ridiculous, like when he came down, he landed. Way where not yeah. where they thought he was going to land, they find him for a long time. Yeah, and because re entry was the, the best challenge for uh, anything that goes into space. Like going is easier, coming back is more difficult because you have to just uh, encounter the, the, the friction of Earth, uh, Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and also, you know, as you know, the Apollo spacecraft uh, landed in, in, in a sea. Uh, so that was a big challenge to, you know, spot the spacecraft. And go there in time and uh, just uh, rescue the, the crew uh, from this uh, small capsule and then rescue the, the capsule itself and bring it back to yeah. the, uh, you know, the factory for just overhaul and uh, relaunch. So that, that was a big thing. Well, uh, speaking of landing uh, a capsule um, in the water, um, uh, Virgin Galactic's doing it with fancy little space plane, uh, Blue Origin as we probably all know, belonging to billionaire Jeff Bezos, um, mm -hmm. is going to do that. Just like, just like uh, I guess, Soyuz, still today. They just throw a parachute, and then the capsule just smacks the ground. And this date is the, uh, the anniversary of uh, Apollo. 52nd. 52nd, yeah. yes. Um, 
comments there uh, from comments. Uh, Kurt, high tensile strength carbon monofilament space elevators. I was enamored with the uh, with the Gibson novels. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the carbon nanotubes. That's that's how I remember reading about that. Not in the 1960s, but uh, um, in the early 2010s. That was our hope, our exciting hope. Uh, Brexit says the Challenger landed on runway, so why not that technology? I mean, that's what they used to do the Virgin Galactic landing. It was essentially, uh, it was just a glider, just like the space shuttles, um, and it slowly glided back to Earth. A lot easier because it's not small. Not nearly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's talk about Blue Origin. So, yeah, Blue Origin is going to be launching on July 20th once again with uh, tourists there um yeah this is going to be next tuesday by the way uh so right before the show we'll have an update on wednesday to tell you guys how it went to talk about it um its successes you know failures whatever whatever goes on uh, and it's entirely possible they don't launch they scrub so see um either way it's pretty, pretty exciting pretty interesting time uh the blue origin um shepherd called uh is actually a reusable rocket so it's going to be a lot like spacex the rocket's going to go up in the air it's going to eject the capsule and the rocket's going to come back and land itself and again so um cost effective but i presume the rocket part is this one right yeah yeah yeah. so yeah people will be sitting in there do you want to see the capsule yes <laughs> this is just crazy. this is pretty much um actually a smaller version of saturn 5 it reminds me saturn 5 and this looks short. <laughs> this looks like a planetarium projector. It does. <laughs> the whole thing looks like a tiny little planetarium. Um, so neat. I I am certainly excited just to see the shots from inside of this. All the other stuff, you know, the accoutrement, I guess, and whatever, but um the shots inside of this, because this looks cool future. It's similar to me, uh in how cool it looks to the inside of the dragon. Space capsule. Anyway, yeah, this is gonna smack down in the desert, um, and they get a few minutes of weightlessness. Jeff Bezos is supposed to actually go to space by the international, um, except the internationally accepted Carmen line or Carmon. Line, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that. Right. Um, interesting point, Levent. I, I want to hear what you think about this. Jeff Bezos is going in this flight. He's taking his brother. Um, taking. I want to know what you think about this. An 82-year-old test pilot named Molly Funk now be placing John Glenn, the oldest person ever launched into space. I don't know. What a cool name, though. Wally Funk. Like some kind of rock star. But Anyway. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the un unnamed auction winner paid $28 million? Secret. <laughs> Secret. Why? It's not me. <laughs> All I can tell. Why don't they want to uh, know? I want to know who it is. Why don't Why aren't they saying it out loud? Uh, I don't crazy. know. Maybe it's a known person and don't want to reveal their identity uh, before the flight. I don't know. Some whatever. people must know. Yeah, whatever. Some people must know. Definitely. Is that you, Jim? By any chance? Uh, definitely not me. Uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, it wasn't me. Definitely not. Anyway, uh, so this is important. Third major flight of this month is not about space tourism. It's about science. It's about getting NASA to space. It's about being more cost effective. Finally. Yeah, finally. We are speaking about science now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rather than is, vacation plans. Directly behind all the dead. All right. So let's switch over. Um, yeah, this is Starliner, Boeing's space capsule to be mm -hmm. a part of the... Not the Dreamliner, but Starliner. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Dreamliner, the inside um, is is it looks like any other capsule. I mean, it's boring. You can see it's just painted steel. Mm -hmm. I was hoping for a, a Dragon space capsule kind of thing, like cool touch screens everywhere, um, beautiful window views. But this looks honestly, it, it looks effective, and that's what it's supposed to be. So whatever, take it. This is supposed to happen on July thirtieth. The Boeing flight, mm -hmm. and if it, if it goes successful, second attempt, if it goes successful, um, they're gonna put humans in. 
And I think that launch should be around November, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. All right, so Boeing is a NASA contractor. Boeing is not only making airplanes, but also making spacecraft, yeah. as, as you see. Like uh, the rockets, so uh, that it gets launched on. Mm -hmm. And most of the NASA like launches have been done through ULA for, mm -hmm. I don't know, the last 20 years, longer. Yeah. Uh, an accumulation of companies. Mm -hmm. Either way. All right. Um, okay. What is next? Next. Uh, next is about the that happened um, over the last few days. Oh, that's um, right. Conjunction. I think, I think I should back out here. This is all you. All right. So uh, let's look at the West. And when we look at the West after uh, sunsets, uh, actually during the sunset is better. We'll see an interesting thing in the sky. So we'll see two planets getting too close to each other just like that. And the brighter one will be Venus. Venus is always a very bright planet. And the, the, the dimmer one or smaller one will be Mars. Mars will also appear red. You can easily tell it's a red, rusty it planet. It doesn't look too red in our screen. Um, well, yeah, but in the, in the real sky, it will look uh, noticeably red because we have better perception in the real sky uh, than in the, in the monitor. And high up over here, there will be moon showing us a nice uh, crescent. So um, when we two, when the two planet comes close, and you heard the term actually, I think the la last year there was an important conjunction of two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and that was a big news on on the media. And here is another conjunction, and this time Venus is Mars getting close, and when two planets get close in the sky, we call them conjunction. So why they are happening? Let's take a look actually, to be able to understand uh, how come they are getting close to uh, uh, each other in the sky, because like they are actually far apart, right? We, especially Venus is being inner planet. Venus the orbits uh, inside of the, the Earth's orbit, so we call it inner planet. And the Mars orbit is on the outside of Earth's orbit. So um, Physically, uh, there is no importance when these two planets get close to each other on their orbit. But from the Earth's perspective, for somebody who is looking from Earth, when they get close, that means uh, they are pretty much getting aligned on the same line. So uh, this is how it looks like from space. We are here on Earth and uh, the Venus appears uh, on the other side of its orbit it could be here too that doesn't matter they would still get close in the sky but somebody looking in this direction will see mars mars is right here and the venus is right here so they pretty much look like on the same line so they get close in the sky we call this conjunction but i, I have to cut in the um you just pointed that that venus could be closer to us mm -hmm. i don't know if you want to point to that spot again but uh, putting it in the same line as uh, with Mars, mm -hmm. but it blows. Venus is so bright right now. Mm -hmm. To think it could be brighter just seems so ridiculous. Well, Venus is always a bright planet because um, it's not only close, but also Venus is covered by thick clouds. The size of Venus is uh, about the size of Earth. So, uh, and also uh, it is covered by clouds and those clouds are so reflective. When we look at the, the uh, surface of Venus through a telescope, you always see a very bright, pretty much like you are looking in a light bulb. Uh, it is very bright. It doesn't show any features, any like surface texture or cloud texture. But the Mars is not that way. Mars is farther than Venus. Um, Mars is a small planet about half size of Earth. And also um, Mars... Uh, Mars is not a very reflective planet, so we can see its surface. Um, all right, yep. so uh, yeah, I was also saying this. Um, yeah, when you look at the configuration, because Venus is an inner planet, uh, inner planets always appear to close to the sun. That means they appear only um, in the early evening or early morning. 
uh, they will not appear in the, the midnight, during the midnight, and they will always get close to the sun. So that means uh, because Venus cannot be on this side, you will not see Venus uh, around midnight. Uh, like Jupiter and Saturn conjunction happens when they are in opposition on the other side. Uh, but Venus, if we are talking about or Mercury or Venus, they are always close to the sun. That means they are either before or after the sun. All right, so um, Venus is a very bright planet. It's also called uh, Shepherd's Star, right? Uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is so bright. I, yeah. guess I, can't, I can't imagine it getting much brighter than what it is now. Anyway, uh, we're, we're also coming up, speaking of conjunction, there is the mm -hmm. other thing that we talk about in the sky that happens often with planets and other things, the opposition, right? We're coming up on two of those, I think. Yes, um, Jupiter is also coming to the um, uh, conjunction, uh, the opposition. Uh, when like the Earth is here, uh, so uh, Jupiter is a little bit ahead, but imagine by Kepler's law, the Earth is moving faster on its orbit, so it will move fast and it will be on the same line with the Sun, Earth and Jupiter. In this case, we'll call uh, Jupiter in opposition. Uh, opposition will take place on August 20. And the same thing will be happening for uh, Saturn too. The Saturn is actually you can earlier. Barely August see Saturn. two, the so August second, Saturn is in uh, opposition, and uh, on August twenty, uh, Jupiter is in opposition. The opposition means they will be visible very high in the sky uh, at midnight. So this this always drives me has always driven me crazy. Um... A lot of times, like right now, if you look at where Venus is relative to the Earth, you would say mm -hmm. Venus is on the opposite side of the sun yes. in a way. Not completely, mm -hmm. but that's not opposition. Opposition is when a planet is on the opposite side of our sky from the sun. <laughs> yes. And also, ridiculous. you know, that means that the planet will be visible through the night because it will uh, just rise with the, the sunset and uh, it will reach to the highest point at the midnight. So that means this is the best uh, viewing pleasure for those planets, especially for Jupiter and Saturn, because mm -hmm. they are large planets. Uh, even with a small telescope, you can pick up a lot of great images. Uh, so that will be the, especially for astrophotographers, that will be the best opportunity to take pictures of Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah, that's you, you try to line an object you want to take mm -hmm. a photo of at opposition, whatever the object is, mm -hmm. and bring a new moon. I have some comments from Kurt. Uh, uh, Olivia said, I have seen Venus here. Yeah, yeah, Venus is just, it's so bright tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, the last several nights, and we'll continue for the next three months, I think, before. Greatest elongation, which I think is like mid October. Mm -hmm. um, Kurt, conjunction, junction. That's stuck in my head for the rest of the day, Kurt. That, I'm... Uh, I know conjunction is only a visual effect of two planets coming together, but does it make me wonder about how planets actually come close to each other? How can we never see planets collide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, yeah the, the, the planets collide, do not collide. We don't see them especially um, at least in our solar system, because these, the solar system have uh, 5 billion years of history. And if any collision was uh, set by their root, and uh, the 5 billion years is, should be more than enough for that collision to happen. So if they survived in those stable orbits, uh, 5 billion years is uh, uh, pretty much, it, it would happen by now. But of course, the things changed. Uh, as the planets orbit, their orbit is not perfectly stable. Every orbit is slightly changing. And especially, this is a, like a multi-body system. Uh, that means as they orbit, uh, they are creating a little torque force on everything else in the solar system uh, by their gravity force. So this gravity force is changing the orbit slightly. Um, and... Uh, these orbits, the, these changes are uh, just happening uh, slowly. Uh, our lifetime, uh, or just that maybe um, uh, someone's lifetime uh, is not enough to see the changes. Like for example, the moon. Moon is actually drifting away from Earth. And at one point in the future, moon will not be part of 
Earth, uh, Earth's gravity system. So the moon will just go away. We'll say bye bye. But it's going to take a lot of uh, time. Uh, I don't remember the rate, but it is just a if just a few centimeters per year. The moon is drifting away from Earth. Um, uh, so we may see planets collide in the future, but not something that we can uh, expect in uh, in even a few thousand years. Is too short time for yeah. that. Yeah. Or if there, or if we have a visitor, we have mm -hmm. a a rogue planet yeah. that comes to the solar right. system. However, there are things in the solar system called asteroids, and asteroids, because there are too many, uh, there are uh, millions of asteroids orbiting. Especially, their dominant region is the between the orbit of Earth, uh, not the Mars, and Jupiter. So you see the gap over here. There is a lot of of those located, and they are orbiting around. Because their shape is irregular and their orbits are not stable like these, they, these are just uh, orbiting around the sun as well. Uh, and they do collide with other planets. Um, if you would like proof, <laughs> when you see a shooting star next time, look in the sky and remember what I said. Uh, because what you have seen is actually not a, like a star in the sky decided to relocate. That doesn't happen. Um, uh, one of those asteroids um, just collides with Earth. This is what's happening. But of course, this collision is not like a direct collision because we have this air layer around our planet called atmosphere. And atmosphere, we talked about the, the challenges with the re-entries of the spacecraft, right? And these are encountering the same things. When they get close to Earth, they encounter a great friction force from air and they start burning and what this is what we see as shooting stars in the sky yeah hopefully we don't have to deal with any crazy ones uh, we have a comment from brexton about black holes in the um well, not likely because the black holes uh first you need a star that is three times or more massive than the sun uh, because there is only one star in our solar system and that is the sun and the sun is not massive enough to form a black hole um if like previously there was a three times more massive star in the solar system and that died uh, after some time and then it collapsed to form a black hole then yeah it, it could exist um it, it could be i mean there are some star systems which there's a, like a regular star and a black hole they are orbiting around each other and maybe they are hosting also planet systems too that's that's possibility not for our solar system yeah i think uh we're safe from black holes at least mm -hmm. here Anyway, uh, yeah, we, we have we had to cut some stuff. I wanted to talk about uh, some things about the moon. We have mm -hmm. NASA contracts um, for moon stuff. Uh, exciting. Um, uh, that are going through, which we'll get to next week, I guess, because we hit our 30 minute mark. And then we have updates on James Webb Space Telescope. And I guess I can't <laughs> announce it's going to definitely happen, but we have uh, uh, an event. You know, on the on the docket for a possibility, given uh, COVID situations. I don't know. This uh, James Webb uh, Telescope updates are. Uh, <laughs> I would like to be optimistic about them because I really would like that telescope to go in space. But <laughs> since 1994, we are hearing the same thing. <laughs> Uh, well, it's huge. <laughs> it's it's enormous. You Hopefully, know? this time I would like to say, uh, let's launch that telescope in space because we so need an optical telescope in space. Hubble is very old. Look how big this. Look how tiny those people are compared to this thing. It's humongous. Yes. Um. Uh, well, the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror size uh, maybe exceeded uh, one person length by one and a half times uh, but yeah this one is huge and also this one is um, optically and then technology wise a better telescope because Hubble Space Telescope was just a, um, a single solid mirror and this one has we talked about this I think uh, maybe 30 live streams ago the, the, the difference in design this like a honeycomb design a honeycomb design like this 
uh, each segments can individually control to eliminate a lot of um, optical artifacts. So this is a much better telescope. And also the location of the telescope is going to be very far from Earth. Uh, it is going to exceed the moon distance by three times. Go to the Lagrangian point two. And uh, from that, th th that telescope is not going to be accessible and serviceable at that point, but it's going to provide uh, better data because uh, electronics will be uh, running cooler. There will be no um, heat effects. Uh, and also, um, I, I, I cannot speak enough, but yeah. this telescope has been designed, manufactured, uh, tested, uh, but... Uh, for decades, it has been just running into a variety of problems, a variety of reasons that it is not in its its spot already. It's still sitting on, I think, uh, somewhere in NASA, in uh, a NASA factory. We, we got um, have a couple of comments here uh, we should get to. Uh, let's just start with uh, Brexton. Is the planetarium open event? Hopefully for you. soon. Uh, we are working for an uh, August date. Yeah, hopefully soon. Uh, let me get comments on it. it yeah, this, this is really important. And uh, this is going to be a big deal when it finally happens. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, question from Kurt. Okay, we just need to make this show happen mm -hmm. twice a week, an hour each time. Just too much. <laughs> I'm grateful that you feel that way, Kurt. Keep sharing this live stream so that we can get some more viewers. Yeah. Um. And uh. And then maybe we'll make it happen. I mean, Levin and I have talked about more times or different times. Yeah. About the live streams, they are not going to uh, come to an end uh, at least very soon, uh, or without any reason, because we are just planning these even after the opening of the planetarium, opening of the fall semester, and doing all the field trips and everything. We would like to still do at least one live stream per week. Yeah. Um, uh, I see a question about the sun. Yeah, when uh, Kenneth says, when the sun explodes, does it show any sign beforehand or can we just die at any minute? Um, no, the, the stars do not explode um, in uh, with no reason. The only reason they explode, uh, first, uh, they are uh, three times more massive than the sun and they, they should be at the end of their lifetime, which means they should be out of hydrogen. And we can uh, calculate the a star's lifetime uh, pretty precisely. Uh, and that lifetime for, for example, like a sun-like star, it is about 10 billion years long. Uh, we consumed 5 billion years already and another 5 billion years to go. So at the end of their lifetime, uh, they don't die immediately either. There is a lot of other processes they, that takes millions of years because the star runs out of hydrogen and then the star changes its size. Uh, it shrinks and then it inflates uh, and then there is another alternative fuel comes into place and the star now starts burning helium. So I just wanna, let's just say, and, and this is obviously I understand the, the possibility of this is, is basically zero. If the sun exploded just mm -hmm. out of nowhere, no warning at all, mm -hmm. Um, his his question, Kenneth says, um, does it show any sign it can be died any minute? Not any minute, because seven if minutes. it did, we have yeah seven minutes, right? Seven eight minutes or something. Yeah. So <laughs> this is another area of physics. We talked about uh, the the speed of light, right? Uh, so speed of light, according to the the speed, the sunlight reaches us after seven minutes after if it leaves the surface of the sun. So that means any changes in the sun. Uh, it's not going to be noticeable for seven minutes. Yeah, but that means that, I mean, it's going to take time for the matter to get to us. Yeah, but again, the sun will not explode. Uh, but another, I mean, the, the sun's uh, not exploding is not the only, or explosion is not the only threat for stars. But it's not going to explode, but there is another thing. Um, there are flare events. Uh, so those flare events are... Uh, or they are also called uh, CMAs, coronal mass uh, ejections, CMEs, sorry. Uh, that means uh, we just look at the sun, it looks very calm and you're very stable, right? Uh, and when you look in detail, it is not actually that calm. 
uh, and also uh, time to time uh, this calmness is disturbed by a big giant uh, fire flame coming off the surface and shooting in space in random direction. So we call them coronal mass ejections. And sometimes they are that intense enough, those fire flames can actually reach to Earth. Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, sometime in 2010s, that actually happened. A big flare um, came out from the, the sun's surface and actually crossed Earth's orbit. If Earth was in that spot, unfortunately it wasn't, uh, the Earth would be completely um, So the only thing that can happen is coronal mass ejection. And we have satellites that are observing these type of events continuously. Um, the area is called Space Better. Uh, just look at on the internet. You can find a lot of resources, especially on NASA website. And we have great uh, Space Better uh researching faculty and i heard dr uh, dan welling received uh, almost nearly one million grant oh yeah he, uh, huge from, grant. from from the from nasa uh to conduct uh, further research on space weather uh we, we have some comments kurt said uh eight and a half minutes for light so maybe he looked up some more accurate data i always just heard eight living seven i mean Whatever. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, uh, uh, you many know, many years for persons now. Nobody will know they have another seven to eight minutes uh, to do something uh, as the final action on Earth. I I agree, Kurt. It would. I mean, like, we'd see something eight minutes later, but I mean, the matter is not going to move at the speed of light. It yeah. might move really close to it, but got a why hey, this is so theoretical because it's just not going to happen if the sun is going to erupt we're going to have some warning unless yeah. it's weather like i mean the possibility is so small just don't count on it something is going to happen after eight minutes also we should we should make a response to kenneth he said that's good to know i can shift my anxiety from explosion to flares the chance of a flare like you said even launching at our orbit is low let alone at where we are in the orbit. Um, and then even if it does hit us, it has to be one of the big ones, like a one that's really powerful enough to do like catastrophic damage rather mm -hmm. than it's really obnoxious damage like taking out satellites. Sun is actually throwing a lot of plasma uh, and the, the, the rate, uh, the magnitude of that plasma flux is changing also uh, all the time. And that's why we see these northern lights and southern lights. Some people are traveling northern places like uh, Iceland, for example, to see um, northern lights, right? Uh, so those are all coming from the, the highly charged particle plasma from the sun. Uh, we have a, a good comment from Touch on that. Which one? Uh, it says, but uh, are there clear signs for these sun flares? Really Back to what you were just talking about. Yeah, uh, the clear signs is what we observed is uh, when there are more uh, sunspots uh, located on the sun's surface, sun appears to be more active and we see more flare events, more coronal mass ejections from the, the surface of the sun. And when the, the number of spots go down, we see a calmer sun. Uh, the reason is not really known for this. Uh, but uh, the number of spots are going up and down on a uh, nearly 11-year cycle. We call it solar cycle. So sometimes you may hear uh, some headlines like that we are at the solar minimum, we are at the solar maximum. So they are talking about 11-year sunspot number change. Uh, and uh, with this 11-year uh, cycle change, uh, sometimes we are going to the maximum and this is when we expect uh, most uh, drastic uh, the, the flare events from the sun. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a few satellites, and one of them is the popular one is SOHO, S-O-H-O, um, monitoring the sun carefully and uh, looking at all of these events. Uh, you can just visit the website and get all the latest solar images and video. That is pretty cool. That, that is so cool. That is really those those images and stuff. Really, really cool. 
Um, anyway, I, that does it for the show, I think. We went, like, typical. We went quite a bit over, and we still have a lot of stuff we didn't cover. We'll get to it next week. <laughs> um, yeah, anything else, Levin? Um, no, I think those are all great questions. Please keep yeah. asking. Um, Thank you guys so much for an awesome stream. We had tons of engagement, and uh, I'm grateful. And uh, we should bring friends, too. <laughs> Maybe next yeah. time. I, Rexton said I'm bringing snickerdoodles when I go into... Oh, well, I asked a question in the discussion. What would you take uh, to the moon? Um, but uh, I guess Rexton is the unnamed person that paid $28 million. All right, guys. I don't know. All right. We'll see you next week. Uh, if you have questions during the week, you can also contact us. Otherwise, we'll see you here same day of the week and same time, right, Jim? Yep, definitely. All right. For now. Bye-bye.